The operator of the damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has begun removing highly radioactive spent nuclear fuel from one of its reactor buildings. It's part of the process to decommission the plant's reactors. Tokyo Electric Power Company last week began removing fuel from the number four reactor pool. TEPCO has more than 1,300 spent fuel assemblies there. Radiation levels around the pool are as high as 300 microsieverts per hour, so a day's work is limited to two hours per person. Workers on Tuesday used a remote-controlled crane to lower a storage container cask into the pool. Then they plan to transfer the fuel assemblies into the cask. Once the cask is full, it will be lifted out and moved. Assemblies of spent fuel rods require far more caution than unused assemblies. The spent fuel assemblies can be distorted by radiation or heat. They might get stuck when extracted from their holding rack. TEPCO plans to repeat the transfer process with all the fuel units by the end of next year. We pity your pathetic dependence on this web video for your weekly news, but here we go anyway. Lawmakers in Japan's lower house have passed a bill that would give government officials sweeping powers to decide what constitutes a state secret. The bill would give senior government officials the authority to define what are known as special secrets. That would include information related to defense, diplomacy, counterintelligence, and counterterrorism. Public servants found leaking or deliberately obtaining such information could be jailed for up to 10 years. The bill is expected to pass the upper house before the current session of the Diet wraps up next month. It co could go into effect next year. This bill is for securing the safety of the Japanese people. We will explain its purpose to them. I know that some of them are concerned about the bill, but we will work hard to address their concerns through debates in the upper house. The largest opposition party, the Democratic Party of Japan, opposed the bill. I'm very angry at this decision. This huge party has ignored the voice of the people. There hasn't been enough discussion of this issue within the Diet. This decision is an act of violence. The ruling coalition of the Liberal Democratic Party and New Komeito discussed changes to the bill at the request of two opposition parties. Some lawmakers wanted to ensure the government would not be able to classify information arbitrarily or in a way that infringes on the people's right to know. Now the bill specifies that secrets will remain classified for a maximum of 60 years with some exceptions. One example is where they include information that could hurt negotiations with foreign governments or international bodies. The bill states that a study will be conducted into creating an independent panel to check whether information classified as a special secret deserves that status. One day some twisted son of a bitch is bound to teach you a thing or two about living in this cold, godforsaken world. Critics argue the bill will allow the government officials to keep, for, or keep far more information from the public, and they fear the provisions do not include enough oversight. NHK World's Tomoko Kamata has more details. This bill is closely related to another one that members of the upper house are debating right now. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is trying to establish a completely new panel to coordinate foreign affairs and defense policies. And this is called a Japanese version of the U.S. National Security Council. But the Americans have been reluctant to share sensitive information with their Japanese allies. So members of the ruling coalition hope that these bills will show that they can control such information. Japan has the National Public Service Act and it already prohibits public servants from sharing secrets and those who leak classified data face up to one year in prison. But members of the ruling coalition say that for some information they need stricter regulations. 
they say this bill will allow them to freely exchange sensitive intelligence with the U.S. and other nations. Some members of the opposition, journalists, writers, and lawyers are urging the administration to reconsider the plan. The country's largest lawyers group argues the bill could allow government officials to classify information as a special secret without justification and they say the prospect of a long prison term will intimidate people who try to access information and undermine people's right to know. Leaders of the ruling coalition met with their opposition counterpart to address some of these issues and they amended parts of the bill. Under these changes, the Prime Minister would be given the right to oversee the classification of information and order corrections. Also, ruling party leaders agreed to consider setting up an independent panel to watch over the process. The critics say checks by the Prime Minister would not prevent errors. Some opposition lawmakers say they need to debate this bill more carefully. But the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe wants to make the state secret bill a law as soon as possible. tracks on and on Put your coat on Let's take a walk
Hi, and welcome to Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast. This is a special holiday podcast where we're going to tell you what we're thankful for. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Arnie to get us started. Yeah, thanks, Nat. It's Thanksgiving season, and we'll be brief so you can enjoy your turkey and you can enjoy your football games. But there's three things the world, and especially the Japanese, should be thankful for about the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. Um, It's hard to use disaster and thanks in the same sentence, but it could have been a lot worse. So the, the first thing that the world should be thankful for are a group of brave, uh, great brave people, mainly men, in Japan, stayed and fought the nuclear disaster when they had a chance to run. They were anonymous. We'll probably never know who they were, but I hope that in time the Japanese government makes a statue to these, we call them the Fukushima 50, but likely there was more than 50, but less than 200. People that stayed behind and knowingly risked getting cancer to save not just their country, but to save the Northern Hemisphere. My hats are off to those brave men. So I'm thankful for their efforts on behalf of the nation of Japan and everybody in the Northern Hemisphere. The second thing I'm thankful for is that the accident happened during the day. The tsunami happened at 2 in the afternoon on a Friday. What that means is a huge difference in the staff. The day staff at Fukushima Daiichi and a little further south at Fukushima Daini numbered about a thousand people. So there was an enormous number of people on site to respond. Now if it had happened at night there would have been maybe 200 people and there would not have been enough people to respond. The, the people that were off-site couldn't have got there because all the roads were destroyed. We would have had 10 meltdowns at Daiichi and Daini were it not for the fact that they had a full complement of people willing to risk their life. We covered this. It could have been a lot worse. There, there's a video on the site by that title that talks about how 13 nuclear reactors were in danger of melting down because they had they were inundated by the tsunami wave and they were crippled because of the earthquake. If you want to find out more about the details of that, I urge you to take a look at that. There's a lesson in Japan. The Japanese understand this. And at uh, Kashiwazaki Kariwa on the Sea of Japan, the Tokyo Electric just announced that its night staff used to be 350 people, and now it's going to be close to 700 people. Why did they do that? The reason is that they understand that they don't have enough people at night at a nuclear plant. This is not a lesson that's being learned in the United States, though. The American regulators will force utilities and reactor owners to beef up their night staff. Accidents don't happen at midday every day of the week. I think that's another important lesson for us, but something that the Japanese can be thankful for. The the last thing that I'm thankful for is really a mixed blessing. When the accident happened, 80% of the nuclear contamination got blown out into the Pacific. If the winds had been blowing the other way and blowing across Japan, it would have cut the country in half and it would have made it uh, not able to function as a nation anymore. I was talking to Prime Minister Khan, who was Prime Minister at the time of the accident, and uh, we were talking about his fear of having to evacuate essentially the whole center of the nation. And he was very critical of his own regulator and his and Tokyo Electric. And his comment was this, he said, quote, the information I was getting was not timely, and was not accurate. Given that no one was telling him the truth in a timely fashion, what saved Japan was that the wind was blowing out to sea. Now I said it's a mixed blessing because contamination is now heading to the west coast of the United States. It is diluted in the Pacific and would have been much more concentrated over Japan. The Japanese need to be thankful that the wind was blowing in the right direction. And and finally, I'm thankful for all the people who listen to these podcasts. It's really gratifying to get your emails and to get comments on Facebook. I do try to read them all and roll your thoughts into upcoming videos. So thank you for keeping in touch with Fairwinds. You can do something for us this holiday season. I hope you consider donating so that we can continue to do this in 2014 to the same degree of excellence that we've tried to maintain in 2013. So thank you. Thank you and enjoy the football game and enjoy your turkey. <laughs>